Welcome back at WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore positive. We are positively at Fadley's, and uh, Mary Miller's got the to prove it. You know, <laughs> so uh, uh, we're eating well here, and we're talking about the future of Baltimore with Mayor Candidate Mary Miller. Make sure you get out, you register early vote on the 16th of April and uh, April 28th. Um, don't take the whole day off, but make sure you get to the polls. It's important. Third segment, we've uh, we've covered tri crime and your background, and I know transportation's a big part of this. We talk about Lexington Market and, and food deserts. We've talked about food stamps, all these mm -hmm. issues. But transportation, getting people around, it is much more of a challenge in Baltimore than it is yeah. in many, many other places uh, and that I travel where I, you know, pop on the Google Maps and just yeah. grab a subway yeah. when I'm in New York or someplace, Japan, other places I've been. Mm -hmm. Sure. So if you're going to pick out a few issues for the next mayor to really focus on, I have to say that transportation has got to be on the list. I think that we make it very hard for people to get to jobs in Baltimore. We have very long commute times. We even make it hard for kids who might want to take advantage of school choice because it's too hard to take numerous buses to get to a better school on One the other side of town. Brandon Scott sat here six months ago and mm. told us how he got to Mervo every day. He came through here. It's extraordinary. Because this was the two, hub. Yeah. two hours, if yeah. I remember. In, in each yeah. direction. I mean, that's just an tribute to Brandon yeah. or any yeah. kid that can do that. But that yeah, no, I meet I meet <laughs> kids in high school and they tell me where they live, and it's almost incredible to think that they're making that commitment every day to travel across Baltimore at enormous commute times. So I'd like to look at what some other cities have done with opening up, you know, streets to make them bus only lanes to try to get faster, particularly east west. Um, transit in Baltimore. I think that we need to close some of the, the gaps in, in service, but also in time. When I talk to people about other cities that are looking at putting in free bus service and making that a commitment from the government to its citizens, I think it's something we should take a look at. But people are more concerned in Baltimore about the quality of the bus service and the way it's working for them. I think that we need to First of all, I'd love to get more people living in Baltimore, fewer cars commuting into Baltimore. That would be great for air quality. But I think we also need to think about ways people can navigate the city by bicycle and other methods as well. Complete that bike loop. That's so one that of we Stephanie Rawlings-Blake, one of her legacies. Yep, yep, yep. What she did here. But, but we need to finish the job. I think what we do is we start projects and then we don't finish them. And I think that there's still a lot that can be done with things like the Greenway Trail. And making biking safer in the city so that people who are trying to navigate Baltimore that way aren't taking too many risks. Well, one of the places that Don and I, uh, you know, I'm a little harsher than he because he lives in Baltimore County, he lives in the city, is, is what Larry Hogan represents in killing a red line mm -hmm. and now i live in baltimore and i literally we've invited larry on larry if you're out there hello Kiefer, wake please, up come please on please join out. us come on Kiefer, come on, get on. the governor on um, for us you know I, i'm concerned that it, much like the president of the united states he's the president of that united states but not the baltimore part yeah, of the united yeah. states or you're 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 the the governor of the state of maryland just not the city of baltimore and the parts i don't like and the things that i, I don't mm -hmm. want to associate with that bothers me and, and yeah. i know I grew up on a bus line. I, my parents never drove, I, and Don knows mm -hmm. this. I took a 23 yep. bus out of East Point Mall. My dad took the number four and the number 10 down to the point. It, my father never drove. He had epilepsy, didn't drive. Okay. And so the bus was my tr It's the way mm -hmm. I got to 33rd Street. All Memorial Stadium memories, mm -hmm. all my hockey memories, and coming out of wrestling matches, and coming to Lexington Market, and going to uh, – it's all buses – but the state is such a big part of this, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. so we, we can talk about the city, but <clears throat> how does the state and the city yeah. work hand in yeah. hand? Because I'm, I'm frustrated with what Annapolis is not doing for my community. Mm -hmm. So I think at a very high level, I think the mayor has to be a much stronger advocate with the state and even with our federal relationships. I think we leave money on the table in Baltimore that we should be eligible for. I would create a, an office in the mayor's front office just working on intergovernmental relations. We should not <coughs> be surprised by the news of the red line being canceled. We should have been in front of that. I think that's, that's part of the job of a mayor is to be a good risk manager, to be looking around the corners and saying, what do we need to be on top of? What do we need to secure? What's our agenda? We shouldn't just be reacting to things. We should be proactively doing things. <coughs> and I think with... Um, um, Go ahead. We'll take a water break. That's fine. Yeah, with public transit, <laughs> you know, it's, Baltimore is unusual in having a state agency run its local transportation system, and we've deeded too much control in that relationship. 
I think we could be using our city's Department of Transportation to make more decisions about how bus service works in Baltimore and to help us take more control of the transit issues because they are a big contributor to poverty in the city. People are locked in places where they can't get to a work opportunity. And we need to really look at that very hard and say, how can we provide better and more service so that we can get people moving around Baltimore the way they need to? You know, Mary, it's interesting. I had never heard it phrased the way you just did in terms of losing the red line. And just a bit of history, and I'm thinking, Mary said we should have been prepared for that, should have been out in front of it. And, I, and I'm well, sitting here. Well, that's what we're going Kerwin. Well, I'm right sitting now. here and I'm thinking, wow, hadn't thought about it. She's so right. And I'll go back to that election day, all the way up to that election day, and I was in a, a campaign war room that day that the Governor Hogan was elected, there was an assumption by everyone that the next governor would be Anthony Brown. And therefore, the red line was done. We so, had the federal funding. We would be breaking yeah. ground very, very soon. Um, that was a that rough it was, evening after It was PM. a done deal. Well, <laughs> I, I knew, it's interesting that you bring that up, Early in the morning, I'm texting back and forth because County Executive Cabinet's very much involved in that race, you know, in his support for the lieutenant governor. And I'm texting back and forth with um, uh, Anthony Brown's staff, and I'm getting responses and responses. And all of a sudden, mid to late afternoon, it was radio silence. Mm -hmm. I've been around enough campaigns to know what that meant. Mm -hmm. And I can remember saying to the County Executive, I think we could be in trouble, meaning mm -hmm. yeah. that Anthony may not win. And mm -hmm. sure enough, as you said, we woke up the next day. I think it was pretty clear the red line was going to go away because mm -hmm. the governor had been pretty, <laughs> Governor Hogan had been pretty clear that he's not a big fan of mass transit. And we didn't have a plan B. Yep. Is that what mm -hmm. you're saying as That's a mayor? That's what I'm saying. Look yep. for plan B. Well, you know, just have a very strong sort of risk management function where you're trying to think about what is what will happen if Harbor Place goes into receivership. Have we thought about cybersecurity at the city level? Why did we have a cyber attack? Why didn't we have insurance against that attack? I think that that's, a, the, you know, those may be business terms, but I think a city needs to bring a laser focus to where are the critical relationships and decisions that are going to affect Baltimore in the future that we need to be not only on top of, we need to be ahead of. And I think we've let too many things happen to us when we should be out in front of them. I, I want to move this more on the political side of your Obama background, not just the backlash of Hogan winning and, and the Trump signs all in the hinterlands in this state mm -hmm. in every corner, but the backlash against everything that you stood for and that you built that you're proud of. Uh, I, I can only imagine. You know, I, I talk to people that built the Orioles to watch it get mm -hmm. torn down and how it makes mm -hmm. them feel 30 years later. I, I, in the aftermath of the carnage of what we've seen here the last three and a half years of mm -hmm. justice, of yeah. truth, um, of crafting a message, which, you know, I guess Fox News mm -hmm. has been pretty, yeah. pretty good at that and, mm -hmm. and getting in bed with the Russians to do yeah. that. But for you over the last three and a half years to watch what you've built be torn apart and to now pick up a shovel and say, I'm going to start yeah. right down the street yeah. from where I live. I think that's something that a lot of angry people like us on yeah, that yeah. side who loved traveling the world with an American passport when Barack Obama was the president because yeah. of what it stood for and now stand truly ashamed. I wake up ashamed every day, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of what, mm -hmm. what this country is, but certainly yeah. the last couple yeah. of weeks. But for the city, for you, I, I just want to give you a little platform because um, I, I want you to breathe in your Obama pride, sure. you know, because you yeah. should. No, I, I couldn't have been prouder to serve that president and... <laughs> He just was inspirational in the way he governed and what he represented to me and to this country. I think that today, the opportunity to me is really at the local government level. I don't see the federal government working for our interests here. At all. But I think there is an opportunity to do something at the local level. And I did a lot of practical things when I was working in the Obama administration. And I'll give you one example of something that has greatly disappointed me. But I helped design and bring out a retirement savings program for low-income seasonal workers who had no access to an employer-sponsored plan to give people a chance to save for retirement and build a, a nest egg so that they wouldn't retire without any financial uh, safety blanket. 
that was the first program that this treasury canceled when they came into office. And I just found that completely disheartening. This was not something that any, you know, business-friendly Republican administration well, should be against. It's empowering <laughs> people to <laughs> save for their own retirement, and we wiped it out. So it brings me back to a city because I think right now I don't see at the federal level, you know, a government that's really serving people, particularly people who live in Baltimore, but we can do a much better job locally. This is where we can make a difference. That's why I'm interested in this race. Well, speaking of local government, and I agree with you, it's where the rubber meets the road. It was funny, we had, we had Governor O'Malley on, and so much of what you're saying, Governor and Mayor O'Malley, touches on themes that he raised, and he said, regardless of what issue you're talking about, at a community meeting, or when you're looking yep. at charts, when you're going over data, but it always comes down to the person saying, show me my house. And I wrote that down yes. because <laughs> about it's how very personal. show <laughs> me my house mm -hmm. because it's how personal mm -hmm. local government is yeah. to people. Nothing's more personal to them, Mary, than education. Their children, their grandchildren. You've rolled out a pretty robust mm -hmm. education plan. You and I shared in an earlier mm -hmm. segment. We're very yeah. pleased that school system has reappointed Dr. Sandalise. We had her on. You want to hear a great discussion about education, go back and pull that segment yeah, up. If you, if you think she's controversial this week, good. Go, yeah. go spend an go, hour Go with spend her. an hour with her, and I think <laughs> you'll be impressed. You brought out this robust plan. Take a few minutes and tell us Mary Miller's education yeah, plan. Sure, sure I'll, I'll try <coughs> to do this succinctly, but I think we do need to get behind the Kerwin Commission recommendations. They are good recommendations, not just for Maryland, but particularly for Baltimore. So I will support those, and I will find the funding to do that. I think that has to be a priority in our budget and really, you know, our obligation to educate our children well. So enough said about that. But outside of that, I think one of the important areas I think we really need to focus on is early childhood education. We can measure the impact of investing early. So we're doing a pretty good job in Baltimore of reaching four-year-olds. I'd like to go to the three-year-olds and say, let's start even earlier and build that foundation. I also think we could do a much better job with workforce training and connecting students in high school who are not planning to go to college with a job. So when they leave high school, they have the skills, they've had the apprenticeships, they've had the internships, and the employers are ready to take them. We don't do a good enough job with our career and technical education, and I would put resources there to make sure that we can get that job pipeline starting quickly for people. Also, I'm also interested in, you know, the discussion we're having as a city that is really important is about how traumatized children are in Baltimore from what they've seen from violent crime and what the issues they're bringing to school are every day. So I support the work that, you know, Zeke Cohen and others have done to build a new way of working across the city to face youth that have seen so much and are unable to perform in school. We need to get to those youth. Well, we hear much wraparound more services, right? Yeah, we, hear, yeah. we hear that term. And that's part of Kerwin. Uh, yeah, and, Community men school. and mental health just in general, just of in what a child mm -hmm. sees, mm -hmm. visualizes, believes, right? Well, yeah. Nestor, mm -hmm. do you remember, and, and Mary, you, you got hundreds of these stories, but we had Chris Battaglia on, who mm -hmm. is principal at Ben Franklin School, uh, one mm -hmm. of the true success community yeah. schools in Baltimore City. And Chris had experience in Baltimore County, had experience mm -hmm. in suburban schools in Harford County, both yep. Baltimore County mm -hmm. and Harford County before he's become this superstar in the city. He gave us an example of what you're talking about. He said, he said Don, let me put it to you this way. And Chris worked for me at one time at, at uh, Catonsville High School. He said, there was a car outside of Ben Franklin that was engulfed in flames. The, the entire car oh was basically exploding in front of our high school. And he said, what I was struck by in terms of our needs to work with kids is that as our kids walked by it in the morning, they shrugged, ah, car's on fire, and they walked in. He said, if you can imagine at Catonsville High or C. Milton Wright, where he was in Harvard, if there had been a car engulfed in flames on the parking lot of Catonsville High School or C. Milton Wright, it would have blown up the entire day in terms yeah. of the community mm -hmm. yeah. rushing to yeah. the school People being Who's at car, people, people being happen. concerned. Yeah, yeah. What? And he said, for my kids, and he told them they're my kids, mm -hmm. it was just another <clears throat> day. Yeah. And Brandon talked about, again, one of your, one of your, talked about 
really stepping over chalk lines yeah. going to the bus. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're talking about, the need yeah. to, you can't look at it in isolation. It's all no, connected, right? We can't just walk past that and say, you're going to be fine. There's a lot going on in the lives of these kids, and I think we need to bring a lot more service and attention to that. So I like the idea of arming people with a different kind of training and different sensitivity to what they're looking at when they see a youth that's misbehaving or has you know, fallen into a criminal path. What got them there? We need to understand that better, and how can we intervene in ways that are going to change that outcome? Well, you, you can't talk about all of those issues and Baltimore City without talking about drugs. Mm -hmm. opioid crisis yep. mm -hmm. what what does mayor miller i mean you're inheriting mm -hmm. this not just you it's mm -hmm. all across the nation yeah. what do you do what do we need to do to address this drug and opioid issue yeah. in baltimore city i think we need to call that the emergency that it is we are losing i think it's two times the number of people to drug addiction deaths in baltimore than to violent crime and we don't hear enough about that i think public health is a city government function I think when you begin to identify specific problems that you want to solve, you start putting the resources towards them, you can make some measurable progress. I like what I saw Dr. Lena Wen do when she was in her job. You know, she Another set a target. Positive yeah, yeah. Go, go check yeah. her out. Three yeah. great ap episodes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she set specific targets to reduce infant mortality in the city, for example, and we saw that go down by 40%. I mean, if you can identify the issue... Get the data. We know we're a data-driven society. But also organize the resources to go after that problem. You can really drive change and success. So I think, you know, we need to bring that to the opioid addiction. We, we are with Mary Miller. She wants to be mayor. Early vote, April 16th. Voting April 28th. As we wrap up, electmarymiller.com. So if you mm -hmm. like what you've heard today in these three episodes, go check it out. As we wrap up. Nestor likes to call them your elevator speech. Why should you be mayor? I think we need a leader who's going to attack our crime problem forcefully, drive a big economic growth program that is inclusive for everyone in Baltimore, and restore excitement and confidence about Baltimore. You know, I want to be the mayor for everyone. I want to bring unity back to the city and drive a much more positive story about Baltimore. Well, I, my, my final piece on this is, uh, as we get up on the election, the money part. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone I've talked to, you don't have enough money to win. They said that to me. Other people, you, you know, that doesn't have enough, doesn't have enough corporate support, doesn't have enough developers, mm -hmm. ch ch church ladies in West Point. I hear all of race. Mm -hmm. You're Caucasian. You can't win. I hear all of that, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The thought about money and your background and what that will represent in West Baltimore mm -hmm. and other yeah. in, in finding people who would, might not be inclined to vote yeah. for you. And the city's changed since Governor Schaefer was here, Kurt Schmoke. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're in a different era. I am so outraged at having the, the integrity. The first word you used an hour mm -hmm. ago was integrity. I need someone with integrity there. If I don't have that... I don't have confidence because mm -hmm. it begins sure. with that. Yeah. And that's my problem in D.C. But integrity and money, mm -hmm. that's where it all, that's yeah. where it gets yeah. cloudy. Mm -hmm. Your money, your background in doing this that you just appeared all of a sudden a few <laughs> weeks ago for many people. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, you know, serving President Obama, I went through two very rigorous sen Senate confirmation <laughs> processes. So I think I can check the box on integrity. But more importantly than that, I think my message really resonates with people when I say I'm not coming from a career politician background. I'm bringing a new set of ideas. I'm bringing a fresh face. But I'm also bringing an enormous amount of experience and commitment. I have no higher political ambition. <laughs> I, there is nothing that I want to do than help the city succeed. I have been blessed to live here. The city has been good to me. And now I want to give that back. What do you think of the mayor's power versus a city manager, some other structural differences that an outsider could come in with? We had Bill Henry on the other day talk about term limits. Mm -hmm. We don't talk to a lot of politicians who talk about yeah, term limits, yeah. but for, for the structure right. and mm -hmm. the power that I guess came with D'Alessandro and Schaefer over the mm -hmm. years, yeah. that this is one of the most powerful mayor yeah. jobs mm -hmm. in the country based on what you can do with budgets and w where money gets allocated and, and what you can get done. That a powerful mayor yeah. who's a competent mayor could make change yeah. quickly. I, right now, I think we do need a strong mayor that can really drive change very effectively and swiftly. Um, 
open to other discussions about um, governance, but I think a lot of the proposals to change are really driven by the disappointment mm -hmm. of the last sure. few administrations. So I, I wouldn't change anything right now. I'd say, let's bring a new person in, a new leader who can set the agenda differently and, and see if we can manage the way we have historically. If we need to make changes, we'll do that. But I don't think right now is the moment to try to change the, the, the governance or the power of the mayor's office. All right, I'll we go with you for now. We, oh, have, yeah, been, we have been <laughs> sitting, we're going to let Mary eat her crab cake. We have been sitting with Mary Miller, electmarymiller.com, if you want to learn more. We encourage everybody, go back, listen to all of our interviews at Baltimore Positive with all the mayoral candidates voting April 16th, early vote. April 28th for the, for the uh, election day. And oh, we if thank you're a mayor candidate, you haven't been on, call us. Call us. We'll we get you on. You. Um, for you. We thank our sponsors at Jennings State <laughs> Fair here at Fadley's and Center, Center of Maryland for making all of these conversations possible. Nestor, they got to vote because democracy is not a spectator sport. Get involved. We're down here at Fadley's and Lexington Market. They're making it bigger and more beautiful and shiny. And uh, we have a little Catonsville announcement a little later on as well. Appreciate you. Thank you for coming by. Thanks so much. Your excuse. Great. Class thank you. You can have your crap. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate Eat Mayor up. Miller stopping by. Make sure you're checking out uh, our vault with all of our Baltimore Positive conversations. We are WNST.net, AM 1570, and WNST Baltimore Positive, and we never stop talking. Baltimore making it better.